Well, Dr. Philip, Dr. Wood, Dr. Eisenach, thank you so much for these fabulous presentations. Um, I think we're going to get a full screen now and get everybody's pictures up. Uh, we don't have any open questions yet. Um, I want to encourage our students that I think the most important component of any presentation is the question and answer period. That's when you get to interact with the conversation. Um, and as a speaker, uh, if I don't get questions, I find it very disappointing. I think the best way to honor a great presentation is to ask some questions. So I'm saying that hoping that our um, med students are all allowed to talk. I think Olivia is working on that. It takes a bit of a moment. Um, you're also welcome to type in questions in that Q&A section. I know it's a little intimidating to ask questions of leading lights in anesthesiology, but I will tell you they all would love to hear questions. Um, and maybe I will start by asking each of you, um, how did you find, how did you find your first important mentor? Uh, Bev, I think you're somehow muted. There you go. Yeah. Hang on. We'll get you unmuted somehow. Yes. Uh, we had to do it twice. Got it. Yes. <laughs> the, um, I, I had a very difficult time with that because I was one of the uh, very early founders of the concept of ambulatory surgery, about going, the, the concept of going home after having surgery. Uh, it was, it, it became apparent to me in my practice it'd be way better care. And I went, I had this, and I was working in the small women's, in the women's hospital. And then when we all merged to form Brigham and Women's, I thought it was going to be, that care that we could provide was going to be lost in the big institution. And I went to my chair at the time and said, I have this, I, I did whatever research there was, and there wasn't any. So there was like no metrics to really pick. And I went to my boss and asked, can we, uh, I, I have this idea about patients would do so much better if they came and went back home and were back well. And I was very young and very female. And, and he, I remember shrugged his shoulders and said, why would anyone want to go home after surgery? So I, I was actually, there were a number of us in parallel, but we did more parallel mentoring because there just wasn't anybody in front of us. When we first got together at the ASA meeting, uh, when we s first connected, uh, uh, we could find 19 of us in the United States. So we were doing more parallel mentoring and it's been like that pretty much throughout my career. Because I, I tend to take... Uh, I, I tend to see opportunities where other people see challenges. Good. Uh, well, uh, when I was um, uh, a resident uh, learning about Halifang, where one of the anesthetics that's only used in some parts of the world, uh, and uh, I knew it was uh, caused enzyme uh, induction. And I wondered if Halifang, uh, it was in the days before scavenging, might. Um, uh, uh, cause enzyme induction and alter drug metabolizing ability. So I remembered somebody from pharmacology who I knew was doing that in humans and I went to talk to him and he said, sure, we can do that. So uh, I actually looked at drug metabolizing ability in operating uh, room personnel and showed, yes, there was indeed enzyme induction. And uh, it, my paper, along with some other uh, manuscripts, was used uh, to bring in to both the US and the UK um, standards, uh, OSHA standards, for example, uh, in healthcare in operating rooms. So it was really exciting and no idea where it was going to lead. But what I would say is it's not just the person who mentored you and showed you how to uh, uh, look at uh, enzyme induction and drug metabolizing ability in uh, operating room personnel. The big thing that also happened was that my boss, uh, when I was uh, invited to go down to London, all the way from Scotland, from St Andrews, you know, I thought I never would be able to go down there. I was a resident, I wouldn't get the time off and 
also I didn't have any money. And he said, sure, you can go. You've got to go. You've got to go down to uh, that meeting, he said. And what's really important is if you, uh, uh, you're not being asked to speak, you're just uh, asked to attend. He says, you get up there and you ask a question. Uh, and uh, when you ask that question, you don't just ask the question. You say your name is Margaret Wood, St. Andrews University, and you ask the question. And that was the first time that I'd actually been taught how it was really uh, important to get your uh, name out there. Uh, so it's different kinds of mentoring, but I've always been very grateful to Murray Lawson for saying, you know, of course you've got to go. Uh, so it, it's everybody. It's uh, you know not just the one person. And Jim, even though your story would be fascinating, we actually have some med student questions, so I'm going to move to them now. So Natalie Coons, do you want to say yours out loud? I think you have to unmute yourself. Yeah, hello everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, I'm Natalie Coons. I'm a rising second year uh, medical student at the University of New England College of Osteopathic Medicine. I'm um, an aspiring clinician scientist in anesthesiology. Um, I had a question about residency programs. Um, are there many residency programs like the APGAR program uh, that include dedicated years for research or is it just as beneficial to do a research fellowship on top of residency? Sh should I take that? Sure. Okay. Uh, I think there are about uh, 15 programs that integrate both the residency experience and the fellowship uh, experience. And, and I think what it does is that uh, even during internship and uh, first year uh, residency is you get a feel for the institution and you, know, you talk about choosing mentors, you're able to choose a mentor so that later on you can hit the ground uh, running. But you know, I, and there are about 10 or 15 of them, I, I think, in the US. Uh, and of course, a lot more research fellowships. Um, but, but I think, you know, the point is, uh, you know, to find a mentor and uh, uh, start to talk to people uh, early. The, the one is not just as beneficial as the other, they're different. Uh, and to some extent, the six years uh, program uh, perhaps is more, uh, is better for the person who knows ahead of time, you know, what they want to do. If you're not quite sure uh, what you want to do, it might be better to do your residency and, and see what you're interested in and then do the uh, research fellowship uh, afterwards. Uh, we had lots of uh, people who saw the Apgar Scholar, Scholar program and then went on to do a research uh, a fellowship with us and, and watched what happened to the Apgar Scholars and, and got a feel for it and, and came to some of the seminars even though they weren't Apgar Scholars. Uh, you know, the program was not closed off uh, just because you weren't an Apgar uh, Scholar. So I think the thing is, as a medical student, to, to look around, uh, go and look at the programs and uh, decide what's best for you. We are thank out of you. time. I'm going to thank everyone for speaking, but I'm also going to ask if you can stay on for a minute. We can still keep ask, answering questions. I just want to give permission for people who have something else to do. Uh, Dr. Wood, thank you. That was a, a great answer. Hopefully, Natalie, you got your answer. Um, our next person is Lou Bam, whose question is... Uh, ready to be answered if he wants to unmute himself. So go, Lou. Hi. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for your time today. My name is Lou Pham. I'm a rising second year medical student at Oakland University, Willem Belmont School of Medicine. And um, I wanted to ask a question about um, because of COVID, a lot of hospitals do not allow medical students to be um, conducting research inside a hospital or even shadowing uh, physicians. Um, what would be your advice on how we can get out somewhere um, to be productive in terms of research-wise? Jim, you got to unmute. Well, I wasn't talking. I was thinking, but oh. <laughs> that's okay. Go ahead. I, yeah, I was going to say something now that I've thought about it. Um, yeah, I, I think it goes back to two things. One is this program that's been put together, I think will be really helpful uh, to keep thinking about research, being exposed to what's going on in the specialty. And, um, and there may be some opportunities that come through that. Certainly you'll be 
learning about reading scientific literature through the Journal Club. Uh, you'll be interacting in very small groups with mentors, uh, which will be very helpful uh, for you going down the road. Um, the second thing uh, related to, to this activity is the meeting in October, and we'll be providing more details once they're known. They're still organizing that meeting, as Dr. Philip mentioned. Uh, but there's going to be a lot of exciting things for the students at that time. Any other answers for that? Other than the, otherwise, we'll move on to, thanks, Lou. We'll move on to Benson Lee, who has a question. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for your presentations. My name is Benson Lee, and uh, I'm a rising second year at SUNY Upstate Medical University. Um, I love stories, and uh, Dr. Eisenberg briefly touched upon this, but I was wondering uh, how each of you became interested in the field of anesthesiology. Oh, I'd love to answer that one because uh, I, I'm from upstate also. See where it gets you. Um, I'm public school educated start to finish, so go team. Um, I think the, I th the, the questions about choosing, choosing anesthesiology as a specialty uh, and I think this is what you're going to be seeing in your third year as you start getting exposed to these. You will find a specialty that meets your, th th that matches who you are and what you want to get done. You want to find a field that, an area that you can be passionate about because you're going to be doing this for your entire life. So you want to, um, as, as you explore which area, what kind of research, and we, we think it, uh, anesthesiology encompasses a lot of it, but I think the core issue is to develop all the physician scientists that we can actually in, in medicine whatsoever. So find the kind of medicine that really, really makes you enthusiastic about what it's doing. And I think I'm, I'm a picture for anesthesiology because it covers so much. Well, I will say I wanted to be a neurologist or an anesthesiologist, and I couldn't decide which. And in the end, it really didn't matter because we go through, and I noticed there are several ESAS people on the call that might want to comment as well. Um, in medicine, regardless of the specialty you go in, you have so many opportunities. Uh, Dr. Philip, Dr. Wood, myself, Dr. Hopp, we've all had at least four careers as part of our medical career. So we are anesthesiologists, but we're also journal editors. We're also deans. We're also leaders of organized medicine. Uh, and, uh, and that's in addition to research careers. So uh, yes, you have to be passionate about why you're going into that field of medicine. Um, but you do have, as Dr. Wood mentioned, other aspects of your life within your work as well as outside of your work that you can you can develop. If, could I want to just reemphasize something that both Jim talked about and, and um, uh, you talked about at some length is the issue about all the things that you can do and how to get it all done. And I want to bring up the really important word prioritize. You cannot this the, you cannot have it all at the same time. I I, I know it sounds hard to listen to, but those of us who have, who have been trying to, um, uh, who are doing what we want to do, you decide what is important to you, you do that, spend most of your energy on that, and at least every year, as you said, Margaret, at least every year, you decide what is priority to you now. And over time, there is times when uh, family is going to be higher or children are going to be higher. I have, I have two grown children. There are times where your clinical learning is important. There's times where the research you want to do, there is time of it, but you have you cannot do 100% of lots of all these things at the same time. Prioritize and commit and do well and and continue to evolve your 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 life and your career. Okay. Um, how about Lydia? Would you like to uh, voice your question for us? Sure. Hi, my name is Lydia Duval. I am just about to start my fourth year of medical school. So I was wondering if maybe some of the panelists could touch on experiences they've had with students as mentors. For example, did a student they mentored, did they end up coming to their residency program or 
were you able to help them navigate the waters of, okay, this program would be a good fit for you? Or, or how did that partnership work out as well? Uh, Harriet, uh, do you want me to? Uh, yeah, please. Is someone else in the question? I'm not going to point to you. You guys just start right. talking. Okay, I, I wasn't sure if you're ready. Uh, well, from a personal point of view, uh, we have, and I think most programs do have people who uh, do come and work over the summer uh, and uh, get involved in research and then decide that this person is going to be their perfect mentor and do end up matching uh, with the program and, and that's fine. But not everybody. Uh, uh, we often advise them that somewhere else would be uh, uh, a better place uh, uh, to go. Uh, and as a chair, uh, I used to uh, have lots of medical students come and talk to me about different programs uh, and you know what kind of programs they were and how did it match uh, their interests. Um, big hospitals, small hospitals, uh, boutique uh, residency programs, large residency programs, uh, all of them offer different things and uh, it, it, it's not that one is better than the other, it's finding for the individual uh, the right match, uh, you know, the best uh, department for them and uh, I, I've done a lot of that and uh, really enjoyed it. It's, it, it's a very rewarding feeling. Dr. Eisenacher, Dr. Philip, any additional thoughts on that? If not, we will move on. Uh, Jordan, um, would you like to ask your question, please? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so my name is Jordan Franchine. I'm a, a second year medical student at the University of Utah. And um, so I'm wondering, so we've asked a lot of questions about research and mentoring. And during this time when those options are pretty limited, uh, due to the pandemic. Do you have any recommendations on books or other literature that give uh, an open insight into the field of anesthesiology? Oh. <laughs> Go I on, I had, yeah, yeah, I think I had responded in typing. I didn't know if we were going to get to your question, but uh, one of my heroes is a woman named Carol Casella, who uh, is a uh, fiction author, anesthesiologist, mother of two sets of twins, who does all of those things somehow. I don't know how she does them. But she's written a series of books. The one that I found most compelling is one called Oxygen. Uh, and she describes in a couple of places the very intense relationship that you have with the patient um, in this very unique time just before surgery. In, in that case, it was a pediatric case, so the interaction was mostly with the parent of the child. Um, but it's something that I've learned to love in, the, in anesthesiology. I think all anesthesiologists who are doing perioperative care certainly do uh, have to love that if they're going to love the specialty. So uh, she's written a few books and if, uh, I think that describes the experience of being an anesthesiologist quite well. Um, I'd also I'd like to add a word of reassurance is that on the um, on the early in the program early in the medical school it's hard to imagine perhaps what anesthesiology is like although what Jim points out is there are ways to have some uh, stories experiences but you when you are in what is for most of most schools the third year of your residency you do will have the opportunity to see what anesthesiology is actually like. And I, I know what, um, it, at Upstate when I was there, it was 10% uh, of our class went into anesthesiology because the faculty was so amazing. Um, like so many other anesthesiologists, I was going to be a surgeon and I'm, I was very good at it. I had an in on an ENT surgery program. Uh, but I came to think, and it was a personal personality decision. I came to understand that I didn't want to be like that when I grew up. That wasn't the kind of person that I wanted to be. And what I saw among our, and what so many of us saw among our anesthesiology 
uh, the, the, the professors, the teachers, is they were so committed to the science, to their work, but they were in parallel committed to life. You could always talk with them about something else. And for me, it was that combination of passion about uh, the, the, the work, passion about the scientific underpinnings of the work, and the, the joy, this is what you're describing also, Jim, the joy of, of, of caring for patients the way we do. The, the, the really, uh, the ability we have such an intense connection um, and really get patients through this critical point in their life. So there's this, you will have, it will, it will be there. I know all three of you are busy people. If you need to go, panelists, please say so. But I noticed we still have almost everybody still on the line and we still have two more questions. So if you have time to stay, I want to continue. Um, Nelson, I think you have a question if you could yes. tell us. Uh, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Well, first I want to you know, thank you all for your insight into the field. I have a question. So my goal is to be an anesthesiologist scientist uh, and in order to really affect how anesthesia is, is done in the world. I want to know how, as, a, as an MS4, uh, hoping to go into anesthesiology, how can I go about to having such an impact on how anesthesia is done in the world? Uh, this, this is, um, if I may, I think lot, this is uh, part of why I went into the organized medicine aspect of anesthesiology. We can all, we love caring for our patients, but you want to do more. And the way to do this is to join with other groups of anesthesiologists who have similar interests. They will, uh, I'm not talking about acquiring the skills, I'm talking about how to get to do that is, uh, get together with other groups. We have, uh, there's a uh, W, there's, um, within ASA, we have a, a, a group that is very much interested in and run programs around the world. Our residents do go and uh, spend time with these programs, mostly in Africa and South America. Uh, so there is, as you come into the specialty, the opportunities will indeed be there but really seek out uh, the global health uh, opportunities within organized anesthesiology. They are there and they are easy to access once you're within. Dr. Woodard, I was not get any comments on. No. Uh, well, yes, there are global uh, anesthesiology uh, fellowships, uh, international. Uh, uh, fellowships, not a lot, but quite a few. Uh, the other thing I, I think that's interesting is looking at big uh, databases, population science, and epidemiology. And uh, some of the uh, guys who do the international fellowships have now set up uh, in Africa, Malawi, uh, one of my uh, faculty, have uh, set up some very nice uh, databases, uh, which are interesting to uh, access and certainly are going to uh, help improve outcomes through, throughout the world, allow uh, someone to make comparisons. Uh, and quite frankly, you can do it during COVID uh, in your bedroom. You can do it right now. I, I would also mention that there are several anesthesiologists who have done Robert Wood Johnson fellowships. And Robert Wood Johnson is, sent, you know, is uh, focused primarily on American public health, but you learn things as part of that program that are quite applicable to global health as well. So it sounds like uh, yet more training. Um, Fair is talking about a 10 year timeline of training beyond residency in a way. Uh, so that, that's an opportunity that I think you could think of that's closer to home uh, down the road a bit. Learning is a lifetime joy. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, well, we only had one last question, but now we have two last questions. But let's get to uh, 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 Srivava, please, if you could ask your question. I hope you're still here. Hello. Um, can everyone hear me? Yes. Hey, uh, my name is Srivava Sharma. Uh, I'm a rising second year student at Eastern Virginia Medical School in Norfolk, Virginia. 
Um, my question is regarding the future of anesthesiology. Um, thank you again for everyone for speaking and um, imparting your wisdom um, upon us. Um, so um, looking forward, there's a lot of um, other anesthesiology professions that are entering the field, such as a uh, nurse anesthetist and um, uh, people who get PhD in anesthesiology. Um, how do you see them impacting the practice of anesthesiologists? Or how do you see the, how anesthesiologists practice changing based on that? Well, I, I, the, the answer is probably, is, is, I would first start with saying, don't worry. Uh, what I am going to say then, the long answer is, uh, modern healthcare is team-based healthcare. And each contribution on member of the team does some part of it. But the, uh, the, all those years that you and I put in for education leaves us really poised to be the leaders in healthcare as physicians are. And I think the reason the, reason the COVID uh, surges that are just sort of coming down to a dull roar have really, really shown us that. We have, anesthesiology has gotten a huge um, uh, positive report in all the media for the physician anesthesiologist that we, what we know and what we can do to improve the public good. Because we have, we have the education and we, uh, to back us up, the science and the training to back us up. For example, some of the works were, um, we've been working with the federal government about, uh, on technology, about adapting anesthesia gas machines for when they were short of ventilators. We protect, work to protect the whole healthcare team by, uh, with uh, sometimes standing up to some of the hospitals, didn't want to provide enough PPE. There's a lot of stuff out there, and when it came, and I think this recent experience really highlights it, that when you, and we do surveys of the population, everybody, they all say they do want the anesthesiologist to lead the team. That's one half of the answer. The other half of the answer is that what is anesthesiology going to be? It's going to be what you make it. This is our specialty and we will make it what we want. We are leaders, we are natural leaders, we're natural collaborators. And we are, we invent things, we innovate. It will be the future that we make it and you will make it after us. I see that Dr. Uh, Karish is online. He's the current editor of uh, Anesthesiology. And I suspect he would say what I have always said, and that is that anesthesiology is the practice of medicine. Uh, it is not the same as the practice of nursing. And, and one of the ways that we clearly distinguish from nurses is in the type of research we do. Um, and so, so I think the research effort and the reason that FAIR exists and the reason that science is a pillar of the American Society of Anesthesiologists is that we believe that better understanding of consciousness or of the world or of near death experience or of how to use ventilators in, in a unique circumstance of a pandemic, all move us forward uh, and contribute to not just anesthesiology, but to medical practice and what we're all about, which is taking care of patients. Uh, so, so I believe the science and the journey that you're embarking on is critical to the specialty uh, as research is critical to medicine in general. I don't know if Evan, if you wanted to comment further. Maybe not. I'm not sure. He, he may not still be. He may have had to leave. Um, thank you. We have one final question. Uh, before we get to that final question, I want to say thank you everybody for sticking around for so long. Thank you to our panelists for just a remarkable session. Um, these videos will go up on our website, so they will be there into the future. Um, Nathan, can you give us our final question of the day? Yeah, of course. Can you all hear me? Yes. Okay. Hi, I'm Nathan Huang. Uh, I'm a second year student at Torre University, California. And I was wondering, uh, what are some of the ways that your mentors were the most helpful to you? And do you think there are any specific important questions that we should all be asking our mentors?
Dr. Eisenach. Well, um, I've had a mentor since 1984. You know, in looking at the pictures around here of all the people that are on the call, it reminds me of mentors. So I live in a sea of mentors, as we all do. We all uh, have more than one, we have more than two, we have people that help us in so many ways. But the one I've had since 1984 has been mentoring uh, related to questions that change as my career changes. Uh, so, so I don't know if there's a single question you should ask. It's probably something that you're very concerned about right now. But really good mentors, I, in my life anyway, have been able to mentor me in many ways. So as I approach retirement, my mentor uh, has, you know, I've spent a fair amount of time talking with my mentor about how he approached retirement. And he, he decided not to retire. So he had to work till he's 85, I have a feeling. Um, but those questions change as science changes around you and your life circumstances change, would be my answer. I don't know that it answers the specific question you should ask a mentor now. Uh, maybe Margaret would have a comment. Well, well as Jim has uh, just said, um, you know, there are lots and lots of questions. Uh, you know, you should obviously ask your mentor and uh, lots and lots of uh, advice in different areas. I think one important thing, though, is to ask the mentor, do you have the time to mentor me? And are you willing to meet with me every six months uh, and sit down with me and uh, talk to me about what's happened in the last six months and what my, uh, or what our uh, to-do list is going to be uh, for the next uh, six months? Uh, because, you know, they can be a great person but if they don't have the time to do it and they're not willing to give you the uh, time, then you may have chosen the right person, but they're not actually the right person. Uh, so I think that's, that really is an important question. That's, that's what I would ask uh, before I got started. I think that is a fabulous piece of advice on which to end. I wanna thank you all for joining us. Um, I want to remind you to go check the schedule um, there is, uh, um, next week we'll have another panel. They change around a little bit, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursdays. I think we might even have one on a Monday because we have to accommodate everybody's schedule. So if you go to the website, you'll be able to find, you'll be getting invitations to all the sessions. Um, we don't really have a great way for people to clap and applaud, but I do want to thank the three of our panelists today for just brilliant insight and wisdom and also for sticking around for an extra half an hour. So thank you all and have a fabulous afternoon. Uh, thank you, Harriet, my pleasure. Thanks for all you're doing, Harriet. Yes, thank you, Harriet. Thank you, Esther panel. And most of all, thank you folks for listening, joining with us. All righty. <laughs>